Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody for the uh, invitation to come back again this year and to share in the conference and to be part of it and to Joel and Tom. I always keep saying it wrong. Uh, but anyway, I thank you for your uh, partnership here in the pulpit. And um, I trust uh, we'll be invited back sometime. <laughs> but anyway, I want to uh, just mention a couple things in the, in the beginning here. Uh, I, I, t I said yesterday about these, we have these two cards back there. And, and what's important about them is we ask you to, to take, you know, if you want to take five, ten of them, take them, okay? But give them out. And, and this one announces, uh, just lets people know about Miss Susan's Bible Buddies. And the address is on there where they can find it. Uh, people say, well, I'm not on Facebook. Well, you know, fine, you know we're on, it's on Facebook, but I'm not on Facebook. Well, you don't have to actually join Facebook to go there and watch the program. And the address there you can, is on there, you can find it. And also our other broadcasts, the Bible Study Hour, Tuesday Bible Time, and the morning coffee, that advertises that for people. But the thing is, on the back is the gospel. So when you're handing these out, you're not only advertising our, pro our programs, but you're also sharing the person the gospel. So that's there. And then, like I said yesterday, there are some pictures of Miss Susan, Spot, and Sammy. Okay, And they're all, they're all signed <laughs> by all three. <laughs> So uh, pick those up, and, um, you know, the more you pick up, the less Susan has to carry out. <laughs> so, and I thank my wife uh, for being my wife and putting up with my shortcoming. I just have one. <laughs> and that sometimes I don't remember everything. And she had to run back to the trailer, which is down in Worthing, and get something that I forgot. So she's back. She's not smiling yet. <laughs> but she's back. So, All right, I have three things I want to do here this morning before we get started. Uh, I would like the first person to, to read for me, read for me, um, Stand and read in your Bible, uh, Ephesians 3, 5. Not by memory. Come on. You're a grace believer. Your Bible should open to that verse. <laughs> in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the spirit okay very good Luke here I have a gift for you now oh there's gifts yeah. <laughs> do you have that already no nope. okay and, and that's just you can have that for half price <laughs> Okay. So. All right. Ladies. Ladies only. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. Stand. I have to stand. Okay. All right, there we go. Is there spiders? Give me a minute. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Who will have all men to be Okay, very good, thank you. But I have nothing for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is for everybody. Okay, let's go here. Let me just pull a verse. See, I have the verse, so I know you're not cheating. So, All right, um, Colossians 1, 25 and 6.
Colossians 1, 25 and 26. Colossians uh. 1, 25 and 26. Of, cor of which I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which hath been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Okay, I got something for you. Come on up here. <laughs> this is a right-handed cup. <laughs> no. Nothing tastes better than cup coffee in a Bible doctrines cup. You share that with people, Bible doctrines, rightly dividing the word. And these are individually made for us by the Chin Indian tribe. <laughs> so what do I do with one I have? Oh. <laughs> All right, all right. Now, before we go any farther, I got a text last night. And it said, make sure you remember the chart because the people are dying to see it. And apparently some people die <laughs> because they aren't here today. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Over there you have our spiritual relationship. Over here you have the physical relationship. Hey, 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 uh-uh, no pictures. <laughs> so now you can see how everything, what's that? <laughs> yeah, we were talking about the other day. There, but there is a chart. There is a chart, okay? All right, today, are we, are we part of the kingdom of God? Let's close in prayer. <laughs> well, the answer is yes. And the answer is no. And again, it, talk, it, it depends on what you're talking about. What do you mean? Um, and so... There are, there are certain beliefs concerning the kingdom of God. Some think, some, you know, it is in heaven. Some say it's, our, it's in our hearts. Uh, some say it's the, it, it is the church. Uh, even nowadays, you'll hear it used in, in relationship to social justice. Um, but I want to look at what is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of God. What is it, and are we part of it? The Old Testament shows us that God rules over all earthly kingdoms. Does it not? He rules over all earth. Just go to 2 Kings chapter uh, 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. That's found shortly after 1 Kings. <laughs> Except in my Bible, where chapters 19 and 20 are carrying on an intimate relationship. <laughs> okay, 1915. It says, And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, for all the kingdoms of the earth thou hast made heaven and earth. And, and uh, several times, over in Isaiah 37, uh, a similar passage is there. But God, God was over all of creation, and God is over all of the kingdoms of man on the earth. Now, this is one area, well, while we're here, let me just say, uh, for many years, uh, we've been in, I was involved in, in uh, the, the uh, Christian school movement in America, and attended uh, national conferences, regional conferences, and things such as that. And what we always heard was, the heart of the king is in the hand of God. And, and is that not true as we deal, go throughout the so-called Old Testament as God dealt with the nation of Israel? Isn't that true? 
But they weren't talking about that. They were talking about today, in the day in which we live. And, and I, I don't want to get into, that's not really, this is just a free side note. I don't believe today God has the heart of the king in his hand and it goes whichever, whichever way he turns it. God is not dealing with mankind at that level today as he has in the past. As he has in the past. I remember uh, in, in 2016, of course, we had a, a, a winner of the election, and, and I, don't, I can't tell you how many believers that I've talked to or read on Facebook, God gave us that winner, and he's going to stamp out abortion. All right? Well, he was the most pro-life president we'd ever had, and he did take steps to it, but, but the fact of the matter is, God gave us him because he was pro-life. What happened in four years? We got a guy who wasn't. Who wasn't. And, and it sounds like God either changed course, <clears throat> made a mistake, or isn't a very powerful God. Correct? Correct? Um, I don't believe today and to me, see, when you talk like that, a lot of people, when you talk about covenant theology or we talk about Calvinism, a lot of people say, well, I'm not a Calvinist, but they're very Calvinistic in their thinking. Because you see, Calvinism is, everything is already predetermined. You have nothing to do about it. All you have to do is sit back and watch it come, come to pass. Am I not right? Okay. And that God's in charge and all we are is little puppets. And they say, well, I don't believe that. Yeah, but you believe that everything happens, it happens because God made it happen. And, and um, I, I don't believe God is working like that in this age of grace in which we live. Uh, I, do, I don't believe God went on vacation, but I don't believe that he is up there and we are nothing but puppets on a string being manipulated by, by God in bringing things to pass. But, but when we come to the Old Testament and you're dealing with God's dealing on a national level with, with the nation of Israel and, and those nations around her, yes, indeed, God was at work. Remember, he would bring, he would bring uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Sennacherib, he would bring them against Israel. He would use that nation to bring punishment to this nation, didn't he? To bring judgment on this nation. God did that. Uh, and, and because he was dealing with this nation, he used this ungodly nation to come down and carry them off into captivity as a judgment upon them. God was working that way. But God isn't working that way today. God isn't working that way uh, today. Uh, the earthly dominion today has been handed over to who is the God of this age? Satan is. Satan is. And, and when we look out there today, and we look at what's going on, what's going on today is exactly according to plan. Satan's plan. And, and that's one thing I don't know that we often understand and, and I, I wanted to, in fact, I had contemplated today even just throwing this away and doing something else. Um, <laughs> you know me, I still might. But, <laughs> but, um, we have, I think we have to see the word of God. And this is a way, I, I mentioned just the other day in, in talking about the curriculum that we have. But we have to, we have to see history all of history from a biblical perspective. We can't look at history from a humanistic perspective. And, and so when we look at it uh, from a humanistic sta standpoint rather than a biblical standpoint, what we see are we have just little Bible stories that, that go take us through the so-called Old Testament. And so you have creation, and then you have the fall, 
And, and then you have, you know, David and Goliath, and you've got Moses, and we just have all these stories that are going on throughout the Old Testament. And, and uh, we have the Philistines and David and, and the giant and, and, and all these kind of battles and these wars and, and all of these things going on. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, beginning in Genesis chapter 3, there was a war declared. There was a war declared. And that war was between God and Satan. And in some regards, between heaven and earth. earth. Harry's a fill-in-the-blank guy. You ever know that? <laughs> but it, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle. And that battle is all over the fact that because of Adam's disobedience, when God came into that garden, he promised he was going to send a redeemer. Correct? And that redeemer was going to come into this world, and that redeemer, as he spoke to the serpent, who was the serpent? When he spoke to the serpent, he said, that person I'm going to send, he doesn't say who, but that person I'm going to send, he is going to crush you. He's going to destroy your power. Okay. Oh yes, you'll harm him, but he'll destroy you. Coming out of the garden, what had to be Satan's number one goal? Prevent that from happening. Prevent that from happening. Prevent that from happening. And as you go throughout the Old Testament, as you, you move forward and, and God deals with mankind, I, I believe the flood is the result of that and that battle. And, and you come through and you come in and now God calls out a man by the name of Abram, changes his name to Abram. Through Abram, he raises Abraham, he raises up this mighty nation. And then he says, through this nation, through that seed of Abraham, through that nation, who's going to come? The seed. The seed. Still no name, but the seed. The seed is going to come. And so... Uh, throughout the, the, the whole period of the Old Testament then, Israel is constantly under attack. Am I not right? Yes. Yes. Not right? For what purpose? To perfect the seed. To perfect the seed. It, it wasn't like, well, they're anti semitic No. He was anti-redeemer. Anti-redeemer. And, and, and why did Pharaoh have the children killed? You've got to get the seed. Why did Herod have the, the, the young boy, the boys killed? I've got to get that seed. I've got to get the seed. And I'm not sure, was it, Joel, you read this passage in Matthew? I did once. Had they known who it was? Well, <laughs> yeah, that one, yeah. First Corinthians. Oh, for, oh, okay, first Corinthians, yes. Had they known who it was, they would not have crucified him. But Satan isn't all-knowing. Satan's not God. Satan's not God. But had they known who that was, they would not have crucified him. Because you see, at the cross, what did he do? He crushed the head of Satan. He had that victory. He had that victory. And, and that's why I say we, we need to see the word of God as an unfolding picture of, of that struggle between good and evil, God and Satan, and you and I are the battlefield. And they're, they're fighting over us. They're fighting over us and, and Satan's dominion over this world and this earth. Now today, Satan has lost the battle, correct? The war's not over, but he's already lost. Now, to, to me, I think Satan's biggest um, objective today is to blind the eyes of the world lest they see the glorious gospel of the grace of God. What he wanted, and what did Satan want? He wanted to be God. He, he's lost that. 
He's lost that. He wanted, Adam had fellowship with God. Satan was jealous of that. I want that. He's lost that. So now what's he doing? If I can't have it, I don't want them to have it either. If I can't have it, I don't want them to have it. And so today, his main objective today is, I need to keep as many people blinded to the truth as I possibly can. That doesn't mean he's not religious. He's a very religious guy. Uh, and, and he's probably very conservative because that's very acceptable. And his job is, is he's not that guy with the red underwear, the horns, and the pitchfork. What he is, he's transformed, he's transformed himself into an angel of right. light. Light. And, and uh, he, he could even be sitting here this morning with his big Bible open. And if you're here, <laughs> I just want you to know you're a loser. <laughs> now that will play in a Pentecostal church. <laughs> we'll, we'll make a reel out of that. So, so anyway, so we had, but what we're doing is somewhere we have, we have that fall and, and, and then we had that battle begins, and God will raise up a nation. God will raise up a, a, a physical, earthly kingdom. And, and, and Satan will have that authority over all of this earth, that power over all of this, that earth. And that authority will reach its peak at what point? When will that authority reach its peak? At the end of the tribulation. When? At the end of the tribulation. Hmm. Hmm. In the middle of the tribulation, what does he do? In the middle of the tribulation, he sets himself up as God and demands worship. And the Bible calls that the abomination of desolation. And, and it will reach that point. In the end, in the end, when the Lord comes back, that will be stripped away. Satan will be bound and cast into the pit for how long? A thousand, years. a thousand years. And Jesus Christ will rule and reign over this earth, and the dominion is going to be given to who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Right? And, and, uh, I, what you know? What would be neat sometime for this conference is to study the Book of Psalms, because the Book of Psalms is a terrific prophetic book. Most people don't think of it as a prophetic book. Uh, every one of the Psalms are talking about prophecy in some way of what's going to happen uh, to the nation of Israel. Uh, think of it. Think of it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Just think about that as, as, as a tribulation. Israel walking through that valley, and who's with them? <laughs> who's with them? So, so the kingdom of God, though, is presented in a general sense and in a particular sense. And in a particular sense, it's talking about um, this God's working with this kingdom that he will be established here on earth, dealing with. Israel. But in a general sense, it's talking about God's realm, God's dominion over all of creation. Over all of creation. So, are we part of the kingdom of God? What are you talking about? Because the answer is no. Because we're not part of Israel. But the answer is yes. Because we are under the reign of God. God in his domain, his dominion. Uh, so what we have to understand is that the kingdom of heaven, we also hear about that. And I want to just mention that very uh, briefly here. That refer, the kingdom of heaven refers to God's rule and reign over Israel. 
over Israel. It's not a, it's not a general term. It's, it's a very particular term. And it's talking about his rule and reign over Israel. All right. go, go with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I think this is a passage everybody here should be familiar with. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10. Well, let's start at the beginning. Verse 8. Be not thou therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye, uh, you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, this, in, this uh, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's this? The Lord's Prayer. Well, not really. <laughs> yeah, it's called it's disciples prayer. It's teaching them what to what this is what they're going to pray as and primarily in the tribulational period, this is what the, the leaders will pray. But he says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. Come. What were they looking for? The coming kingdom. The coming kingdom. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, right? Where? In earth as in heaven. As in heaven. And, and what, we have to understand, what do you mean as in heaven? I thought it was, okay, you have to understand this. When, when Moses was given the tabernacle, Moses' tabernacle was just a model of another tabernacle. In there, in heaven. So what we have here begins there. Begins there. And, and he says, so thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. So you, you begin in the old. Uh, when God called Abram and he sent him off, and, and Abram was in search of a city, correct? And God would begin to lay out his plan for this earth through the nation of Israel. And, and, and that nation would, eventually he would promise to that nation, covenant with that nation, that he was going to make them a mighty kingdom and give them a king, correct? And, and that king would come... Uh, the, the kingdom would all re originate under the seed of David, right? And so it is to David that God makes this covenant of this everlasting kingdom that was to come. come. So when you go throughout the so-called Old Testament, these, these, the saints of the Old Testament were looking somewhere without any idea Somewhere out there is, is this kingdom that God is going to give us. Correct? All right. Somewhere out there is this kingdom that God is going to give to us. Now, when you step out of the so-called Old Testament and you come over into what man calls the New Testament, John the Baptist comes out of the wilderness, and John the Baptist comes declaring what? The kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. At hand. So instead of out there, now what is it? It's close. It's close. What did Jesus preach when he came? Same thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is another area that much of evangelism doesn't buy, doesn't understand. I, I use that because in my way of thinking, the term, two terms are totally meaning, meaningless today. One of them is Christian, totally meaningless today. The other one is evangelical. What does evangelical mean? It depends on who you're talking to. Evangelicalism is basically a doctrinal statement in a three-ring notebook. So you're talking to someone, well, we can't agree on it, but well, that's no problem. We'll just get rid of that one. 
<laughs> Am I right? Anybody want to? We're right. And I, so I refer to it as evangelism. We can go whatever way you want to go. We're all right here. But they don't understand these, this, this concept of a king and a kingdom and a kingdom that's coming from heaven and establishment of a kingdom here on earth. They don't understand that. But all of that is linked to the covenants and the promises that God made with Israel. 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 Of course, covenant theology, they just wipe out Israel and put in the body of Christ. You know, Just put it in there. But Christ, ultimately, Jesus Christ will be that one who sits and rules and reigns in that kingdom. He is of the seed of David. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever done a read through the Bible. You, know, you get into those chapters where it's somebody begat somebody and they lived 100 years and they had sons and daughters and they begat here and, they, and you think, can we move on to the next chapter? And the next chapter looks a lot like the previous chapter. Can we move on to the next book? I believe, I believe there's nothing in there that isn't there for a reason. And I think even those genealogies help us to put things into perspective and who was where and what they were doing and when they were doing it and how it overlaps and how we can see that. And you get into Matthew and Luke and what, do, what does Matthew and Luke do for us? It gives to us the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Why? Just, just to know where he, who he is? It gives to us his right to the throne. His right to the throne. What's very interesting, why is it, why do we have two of them? Anybody know why we have two of them? Does anybody here know anything? <laughs> Harry does. <laughs> Look at Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, and, and, uh, and we have, I'm going to go over to Luke. In Luke chapter 2, uh, Luke chapter 3. In Luke, in Matthew chapter 1, um, I want you to go down to, let's just go down to verse 11. Matthew chapter 1, verse 11. Now this starts off in verse 1, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then Abraham, Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, uh, Judas, and his brethren, and, Jude, and it comes all the way down to all these uh, kings, and Solomon, and David, and come down, and you come down to verse 11, and it says, and Josias begat who? Jeconiah. In the Old Testament, you refer to him as Con uh, Coniah. Okay? Uh, or or uh, Je uh, I forget. Anyway, uh, Jeconiah. Can anybody tell me something about, that's very important about Jeconiah? Harry? <laughs> <laughs> Jeconiah was an evil king. And God told Jeconiah, no one from your family will ever sit on that throne again. What's that do to the seed of David? The line of David? Stop it. Stops it. Who do you think's behind that? That's why you have two genealogies. Because Jesus Christ had a claim. Because you see, David had another son. What was his name? Solomon. Nathan. 
And if you look at the problem uh, of the genealogy of Luke, it goes back through Nathan and the claim to the seats, the line of David, the line of David. So don't just pass over these genealogies. Look at them. Look at them. And I'm not going to give you the verses. You can look back through the genealogy itself. David, Christ is David's ultimate son, will rule over Israel and rule over the earth. Uh, and and uh, so now, oh, hey, 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 hey. I got a chart. <laughs> hey, Byron, look up here. We got a chart. <laughs> And, and the chart basically gives to us the overview of here's the kingdom of God. There's the Israel's rule, hit their place, and the body of Christ is over here. There's no overlap. There's no link. But the overall is the rule of God over all in heaven and earth. earth. In earth. And not only do I have the chart, I have two charts. <laughs> Where we have the Old Covenant, which is basically what? The, the Law, the Old Testament. Okay. Well, beginning with Genesis uh, 12, or Genesis 17 when it's given. But you have the Old Covenant. So you have Moses and you have Dave, uh, Moses and David and Daniel. And I always, I've, I've always include Daniel because you can't understand this chart without Daniel. God gives to him a chart. And we need to put it in here. Then you have the cross of Christ. Well, you have John the Baptist. You have J Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ. And, oh, oh I forgot I have this. Uh -huh. So you have the cross and you have Jesus Christ. Then you have Peter on P at Pentecost. And, and this is the first days of the, of the end. The first days of the end. And then you have this thing called this, I call it here, an interruption. An interruption. And, and what is that? That's the present age. That's the present age. That's the body of Christ. That is a heavenly entity. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes. All, this is an earthly entity. So you have the kingdom of God over all of it. Here, here's this body of Christ, as Joel talked about yesterday. How much of it back here do we find? None. 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 How much of it here do we find? None. The only time we ever have the body of Christ is right here in Paul's writings, basically Romans to Philemon. That's it. You'll never find it anywhere else. But then, when the body of Christ is raptured away, when is that? Ask Tom. <laughs> he didn't share it with us. <laughs> when the body of Christ is raptured away, God's time clock will begin to tick once again. And when God's time clock begins to tick once again, this that started back here will play out. And this is part of the new covenant. Spoken of in the Old Testament by Jeremiah and others. Now we have the old, the New Covenant, which is basically the theme of the book of Hebrews. The New Covenant. The New Covenant is basically, the book of Hebrews is to the tribulation and the, and the kingdom era here. It's, it's just like the book of Romans to us today. It tells us what happened and what we have. And the book of Hebrews lays out to Israel what happened, what Christ did, and what they need to do. And it's the new covenant. And it, so these books, from Hebrews to Revelation, all have to do with the new covenant. The new covenant. Now, just uh, in past, what time did that be done? Twelve? <laughs> Five minutes ago, right? Yeah. But let me just say this. Forget this even exists. Take it out of your Bible. All right? Take it out of your Bible. When Peter stood on the day of Pentecost and said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, 
which is back here, right? What was he talking about? The beginning of the end. The first days of the end. It's going to be over. It's going to be over. But we have these books. These books. Hebrews to Revelation. All right? And, and someone asked, how, come, how comes these books were given after Paul had finished his book? His books. Well, they, the way they are in your Bible is not the way they, not the order in which they were given. Okay. You have to understand all of these books, all of these books were written back here. All of them were written back here. And all of them deal with Israel's problem in the tribulation. And the fact, Peter, over and over again, how many, how many times does Peter say, endure? Endure, endure. And John uses a different term. He says, overcome, 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 overcome. And, and that's because primarily these books were written back here. Because these people were getting ready for the tribulation. What happened? God interrupted that. God interrupted that. And so now all of these books will play out now after the rapture. After the rapture. When God's timetable, his, his clock, begins to tick again. But had God not clicked the watch, all of this would be done. And somehow we would play out under all of this in some way, if we had lived and all of that. So anyway, that's, that's my three charts <laughs> that you have there now. Okay? So, all right. Um, well, I'm done. <laughs> I do have a chart. I do have a handout in the back. It's free. Uh, I didn't write this. I just copied it. Plagiarized. I just copied it. I didn't plagiarize it. I just copied it. Um, this deals with Luke 17, 20 and 21, where the passage deals with the, he the kingdom of heaven is in you. What's it mean to be in you? And so I knew I wouldn't have time, so I just found this and I, cop I liked it and I copied it. And so it's in a box on the table there. But if you'd like one, you have to get it right away. Okay. So are you going to turn that off? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. <laughs>